On behalf of Moray House Trust, welcome to another talk in the Salmon Tree series entitled The Guyana Maroons, 1796 to 1834, Persistent and Resilient Until the End of Slavery. First, a quick note about the photo used in the flyer. It dates from 1883 and shows a group of Maroons in Dutch Guyana or Suriname. Maroon communities existed on the periphery of history as well as society. Images of them are therefore hard to find. Nevertheless, it seemed important to show them in the flesh rather than as depicted by colonial artists, for example. For any newcomers, Moray House Trust is a private, non-partisan, non-profit, based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Carries. I am the chair of trustees at Moray House Trust and your host for this session. A warm Guyanese welcome to our regulars. Today's talk is part of the Trust's Saman Tree series, short daytime midweek sessions aimed at those with curious minds and a little free time during the day. As the name suggests, the Saman Tree series seeks to draw on local habits and traditions. Traditions of gathering, of talking, of listening. We welcome suggestions and volunteers for future talks. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. David Alston once again. Dr. Alston spoke to us in March about the 1814 uprising in Babise, half a century after the famous 1763 uprising, in other words, and about a decade before the 1823 rebellion. Dr. Alston is a historian and former museum curator and teacher. He has collated research about Scotland's links to Guyana pre-1843 on the Slaves and Highlanders website for many years. He's also recently published a book entitled Slaves and Highlanders, Silenced Histories of Scotland and the Caribbean. Today, I'd like to make three points to frame Dr. Alston's talk about the Guyana Maroons. And I will repeat a little of what I said when introducing his talk about the Burbies uprising six months ago. First, looking back over a history of centuries of slavery and our genesis as a plantation society and economy, there are many possible perspectives. On one hand, we can focus on the systems and structures of control that underpinned the plantation complex. And let us be honest, these were overwhelming. On the other hand, as far as the records permit, we can focus on the actions of the enslaved. In her peerless study of the 1823 rebellion, Emilia Viotti da Costa shows in a close reading of the records that slaves and masters were locked in a perpetual, relentless struggle for agency and control. As da Costa writes, slaves were not the passive victims of oppression, often portrayed by abolitionists and missionaries. They fought back in every way they could, always trying to gain more control over their lives. Rebellion was only the most extreme of many forms of resistance. These included running away, killing horses or poultry, breaking tools or machines, poisoning or attacking drivers, managers or overseers, even infanticide and suicide. Mostly though, the slaves' resistance centered on work and included acts recorded as insubordination, underperformance and destruction of property. As de Costa concludes 
Without the daily and tenacious acts of defiance and sabotage, rebellions would have been difficult, if not impossible. It was in daily resistance that slaves reinforced their commitments to their rights and tested the limits of their master's power. It is this background hum of constant resistance that forms the framework for what we will learn about today. Insofar as slavery was a concerted attempt to deny agency to the enslaved, it failed. Resistance was pervasive and perpetual. It took many forms. Alongside slavery, in other words, there was what Dr. Alston calls a continuous pattern of resistance and revolt. In a sense, rebellions were the tip of the iceberg of resistance, episodes where resistance congealed and broke through the web of oppression. Understandably, they have absorbed much of the historical limelight. However, they existed alongside other more mundane forms of resistance. And of course, some slaves escaped from the plantations, some repeatedly. Put simply, revolts were one radical response to slavery. Running away or escaping the regime was another. This brings us to the second point. When slaves escaped and formed communities, they often disappeared from the history books. Maroon communities are often at the margins of our history, beyond the historical gaze. There isn't a clear documentary trail of evidence about them. Much of it is oblique and has to be gathered from obscure and varied sources. And yet, of course, their significance is enormous in terms of the broader narrative arc of slavery and resistance. This is an area worthy of further research and study. We need to know more about these communities. Third and finally, to discuss resistance is not to minimize the scale and impact of slavery. The institution of slavery was all pervasive. In his book, Dr. Alston shows how its tentacles spread to every facet of social and economic life in the colonies and the metropolis. It was embedded in their societies and economies. Dr. Alston outlines the apparatus of terror required to maintain forced labor on the plantations. He also shows that slavery was the foundation for a whole system of trade across the Atlantic, underpinning over the course of time, the development of Britain's financial institutions and payment systems. Against this, maroon communities were outliers. They represent the undermining of this all pervasive system of control. Thank you very much for that thoughtful introduction, Isabel. It's very helpful. Before I share my screen and um, begin my presentation, can I say that this research that I've done has only been possible because of the cooperation which took place between the National Archives of Guyana mm -hmm. and the National Archives of the Netherlands. That's resulted in the conservation digitizing and free availability of everything in the Guyana archives up to 1815, um, when what had been Dutch colonies were formerly ceded to Britain. Um, everything up to that point in the archives is called the Dutch series. Uh, and I think a, lo a lot of people didn't realize when this, when this material first became available, that although it's called the Dutch series, a great deal of the material is in English. Um, so from the point at which Britain seized control of the colonies in 1796 up to 1815, uh, Britain is running the colonies. Um, and often the 
the the records are are bilingual. It, but it's still the case that I, I I'm not a Dutch speaker, and somebody who is a Dutch speaker could probably get more out of these records. And I think it's it emphasizes the point that Isabel has has made that there is there is more to be done in exploring this history. And I, I hope everyone, everyone can see that. Uh, yeah, we can. Good. Thank you. Um, I've got. I, there will be a lot of maps in, in this presentation. I, I, I hope they're all they're all clear enough to you. Um, I'm I'm talking from 1796, from the point at which Britain took control of of these colonies. Um, but I want to say something about what what was happening at, at just before. Um, Britain took over. And that was the fact that in the, in the dying days of Dutch control, there was an uprising on the west coast of Demerara, uh, 1795. And that was attributed by the Dutch authorities to Maroons, Maroons who were attacking plantations and encouraging enslaved people on the plantations to resist enslavement. I just wanted to put this map up to show you where this was happening. These are the plantations which were involved. Um, and the records identify that the maroon camps were somewhere in this area um, behind the plantations. And that, that location is going to be important um, um, later, later, in my, later in my talk. Um, when Britain took over, um, one of the things that that did was to open up the colony of Berbice to settlement by British, by non-Dutch um, plantation owners, particularly in the development of coastal plantations. The, these plantations, which are outlined here in this map of um, 1804, um, and these are these are being created at the point when this map is is made. So to to, to some extent, this map is an aspirational map. It's it's all of the plantations they 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 hope to create. And this has been created. The, these plantations, the same is happening on the east coast of Demerara, slightly ahead of this, but still most of the the the, the plantations are being extended to what to more Berbies from, from Demerara along the Demerara East Coast. Now this map I think is useful because it outlines the, the terrain. Uh, and this is significant from the, when, when we try to look at how the plantocracy was controlling these, these colonies. Um, behind the coastal plantations, there, there was an area of, of savanna and some of that was was very swampy and almost all of it would be parts of it would be swamped during the wet seasons along the river were the older dutch plantations and further back still were plantations which been which had been abandoned but where there was still uh, remnants of earlier dutch settlement the the old fort here the dutch had established a series of what they of, of what they called um a number of what they call post holders. Now these post holders were there to manage relationships with the Amerindians. And you also see on this map that there's a what they called an Indian path identified. Now these the Dutch knew that these relationships with the Amerindians were crucial to the control of the colony. At first, mm -hmm. um, the British authorities I don't think fully recognized this, um, but once they did recognize it, they too saw that the way and the only way in which this the, this colony these colonies could be controlled with such a small number of of whites and with increasing numbers of enslaved Africans was by alliances with the Amerindians, and these took the form of annual payments, which were which were called gifts um, to to the to Amerindian tribes, uh, annual an annual feast, and then when when the colonies wanted to mount expeditions to capture runaway slaves that was done with the active cooperation of Amerindians who, who knew the rainforest and the plan the, the effect of that was to contain any runaways any, any maroons within this area between the the coastal plantations and this the part of the back which was controlled 
by by Amerindians. So the the the, the policy is one of of control and containment. And that's that's very important for for what I'm saying. Um, so I, I I want to jump forward to um, oh sorry I should I should say it, also say that with within that area of the savanna, um, the in 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 the rainy seasons the the places where um, maroon camps could survive were on these higher areas of of sand hills. And, and this is a picture from 1807 of, of some of the sand hills along the, the Demerara River. Um, but it's this higher, this higher ground within the savanna, which is important. Now, this map of um, uh, shows, I, I, I'll explain it in some detail. By 1801, the, the, the authorities in both Berbis and Demo are, are aware of the importance of alliances with the Amerindians. And there's a, there's a, a particularly important person called Charles Edmonston, um, who is a planter who generally lives at a timber estate um, on the Mibiri Creek off the Demerara River. And Edmonston's importance is that his wife was uh, part Amerindian, part, her, her mother was Arawak. And he, although he was a large plantation owner, he chose to live on this more remote plantation, a timber, which was a timber estate. And by living there, he built up relationships with the, the Arawak. And it was Edmonston who effectively read, led what they called bush expeditions, that is expeditions to recapture runaway, runaway slaves and to destroy maroon encampments. And he, um, in later life, he gave a detailed account of an expedition in 1801 in which he was quite seriously wounded. And the target of that expedition was, was th this area here. Um, he was wounded and carried back across the Demera River here to, to his timber estate, survived, um, and was leading an expedition the following year in this area here, which is, is the same area that I showed you on that earlier map. But what's also important is that Edmonston was giving advice to the to the governors of the colony and to the colony administrations. And what he was highlighting in 1801-1802 was his concern about what he called maroon lines of communication. And he talked about how maroons were able to travel uh, on routes behind the plantations uh, high up the, the Demerara River to the Lou Plantation, and then across, um, a, a, in fact, he said, as far as, as far as the Corentine River. And he said there were so many Maroons uh, on these routes that it threatened the ability of the Amerindians to use them. And he saw this as a serious threat to the security of the colonies. Uh, and that's uh, a picture of Edmonston's uh, house at Mebury Creek, which was visited by um, by qu quite a number of uh, other planters and by by visitors from from Europe. Um, now, what I want to do now is to look um, try to shift the focus um, away from the, the the white planters to the maroons themselves and and do that through a, a, an incident in 1804 in Berbice. Now at this point the, the the plantations on the west coast of Berbice are are, are being created. I, I should have said at the beginning that the these maps are upside down in our terms so south is at the, is at the top. So this is this is the west coast of, of Berbice here. Um, the Abbey Creek is the boundary between two colonies, between Berbice and Demerara Essequibo, which have different governors, different administrations. Um, in 1804, uh, a group of planters on the west coast of Berbice uh, submitted a memo memorial um, to, the, to the fiscal of the colony. And I want to read how that begins, because I think it begins to give us a sense of just how, just what a threat the Maroons were perceived to be and how strong the, the Maroon camps were. They began it in this way. 
as we cannot doubt that the facts we are about to state will appear to you, as they do to us, of the utmost importance, not only to the welfare, but also to the existence of these colonies. So they're saying that the, what they're about to say is a description of a threat to the very existence of the colonies. If the if maroons if if the maroon if maroon camps can't be controlled, this is an existential threat. the The events I'm going to talk about focus on the whole of this area, but on a few plantations in particular, Plantation Bran, um, Plantation Union, um, and plant, Plantation Number Fifteen and Sixteen, and Number Seventeen, which is Jacoba Willemina. Um, so what the memorial goes on to say that because there had been um, so many enslaved Africans running away from the plantations, they'd mounted a number of uh, they'd sent out a number of parties to reconnoiter. Um, but one of these parties um, had crossed the Abbey. Um, somewhere behind plantations number 15, 15 and 16, so about here. And there they'd come across a hut um, where they found one maroon um, who'd been, in their words, absent for about two years. That is, he'd, he'd escaped two years ago. Um, and in the hut, he had a considerable quantity of rice, tobacco, and other articles. Um, they they took him prisoner. Um, they but and but proceeded beyond this hut and came across a maroon settlement. Now it was too large for them to think about any kind of attack on it, so they went back to the coast, um, and then another uh, party set out from number seventeen. Um, it it also recon um, it, it also saw this camp, got a, got a much better view of it. Um, as soon as they were spotted, the, the Maroons evacuated the camp, um, but the, they were able to destroy quite a number of the buildings, of you know, the huts in the, the camp. And they the reported um, that they, they burnt the huts, two of which were storehouses full of rice. Um, and they also made a complete list of all of the other crops that were growing in this area. But they, they still hadn't attacked the main camp. So yet another expedition set out. This consisted of um, about 50 people. Um, some of them were enslaved Africans who were regarded as, trust, as in, in, the, in the terms of the, the, the white planters, um, trustworthy and who were armed. Um, and some of them were um, planters themselves. They, they moved beyond where this hut was and beyond where that first that first settlement was um, to discover yet another maroon camp, um, which they attacked, but they were only able to seize one maroon. Uh, now, from other sources, I, I know that this was an Akan man um, who'd been brought to the colony the year before and he, who was on plantation Bran and who had been given the the name Inverness. Uh, so in a co with a combination of looking at what was in the camps and information that they gone from in, got from Inverness, they were able to build up quite a, a detailed picture of the the Maroon settlement and I think this is certainly it's, it's the most detailed account of a Maroon camp in Guyana that I that I've come across. Um, the key things to to note are the the range of crops that were being grown there. They listed nineteen separate crops that were were being grown. Um, and um, in, Inverness was able to give them the the information that the camp had consisted of fifty men, but just one woman. And that woman was the wife of their chief, who was the man who had been captured, in, first of all, in, in the hut beside the Abbey. And he had been on his way to the, to the coast to trade with the coast. And I think that means to trade with enslaved people on the coast. Uh, 
on in the camp, it's not only that they were they were growing um, this range of crops, but they 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 also had blacksmiths and carpenters, and they they were making they were making clothes, um, including salt. And the scale of their cultivation was such that in the in the first camp that they'd come to, there were two hundred acres under cultivation. Um, they were also, I, I should say, growing tobacco and making to making tobacco pipes. Uh, so I hope that I think that description gives gives a sense of just how how well established the the community was and how successful they were in establishing agriculture in 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 this savannah area they didn't so at, at this point although they had attacked the camp and learned about it they hadn't succeeded in um, in destroying the maroon camp this is 1804 um, five years later, they believe that this camp has grown to, to have at least 100 people in it, possibly more. And at this point, there is cooperation between Berbice and Demerara, between the two colonies. They hold a, a sort of summit at Plantation Trafalgar, uh, where both governors are present, and they agree to mount a joint expedition with uh, somebody called Van den Broek, leading the, the the party assembled in Berbice and Charles Edmonston leading the party in Demerara. Now this time, um, this is a full bush expedition consisting of a few white planters, some armed enslaved men, but the majority being Amerindians who have been, been assembled. And it's a pincer movement up the um, up the dem up on either side of, of Abbey Creek. And that's in December in 1809. At the beginning of um, in January 1810, um, this this the, the parties return to Stabrock to what became Georgetown in, in, in Demerara. Um, and they're able to announce what they regard as the success of the expedition. Um, and in a, in a report that Edmonston provided to the governor, he says that um, that on holding out a promise of pardon, and I, this is, I'm quoting using the language of the time, 23 Negroes surrendered on the conditions offered them. 43 more were surprised while holding a consultation on the proffered terms. 10 were taken prisoners and we have ascertained 26 more were killed, making the whole 102. The, I should say that the bounty paid to the Amerindians for those who were killed was paid on the production of a severed right hand. And this was a practice that continued for a few years after that and was then, discont was then discontinued. What's interesting about this account is the, the offer of pardon. What that what that actually meant was that they were they, they were promised that if they surrendered, they they wouldn't be pu punished either with corporal or capital punishment, and crucially, they wouldn't be returned to their former owners. They would be sold on. Um, initially, um, the plan was that they would be sold on to out of the colonies to to other Caribbean islands. And it, it, it's interesting, I, th I think it's a mark of how, of the strength of the Maroons, that Charles Edmonston was absolutely convinced that the only way of, of dealing with this was by negotiation. And he insisted that as he had given his word of honour, um, these terms of surrender must be adhered to, and, and they were. Uh, what happened was that the um, those who had been those who had been those who had surrendered uh, were first of all taken to to Demerara, and eventually this was a very complicated bureaucratic process because it involved two colonies with two administrations. 
most of the owners were in Berbice, but the sales were taking pl place in Demerara. It took over two years to sort it out, but eventually um, a notice appeared in the in the Berbice Gazette, and this is in June 1812, so it's, it's getting closer to two and a half years afterwards, um, announcing that they had successfully sold a, a public vendue the those enslaved people who had been who had surrendered. Um, and what's interesting is is that when you look at the list, and I've just selected a, a section of it, um, is the number of women and children. So although um, in 1804 this camp had only one woman, it's clear but that by this point it's a it, it's it's a much more mixed community. There are women and there are there are children um and and that I think both means that it, it's more sustainable. And also I suspect that the work's been divided up in a different way because certainly with the, the Suriname Maroons, it's very largely the women who are um, the, main, the, the, main, the main farmers in, in, on, on what they would call garden plots in, in the forest. So this, the, so this camp has, has grown significantly. And although 102 people were either captured or killed or surrendered, um, it survived, so it, it must have been it must be even bigger, obviously, than than, than that hundred and two. Uh, nevertheless, um, Edmonston's expedition was seen as a success. But I should say that the the for Demerara, the cost of that expedition for the for the for the government of Demerara was a third of their annual expenditure, and that again is an indication of just how. Seriously, they took what they regarded as a threat from Maroons, and that in turn turns is about the strength of the Maroon community. Um, now, I'm um, just jumping forward a bit here to uh, there. There are there are reports of, of of other expeditions against Maroon camps. I'm just picking out some some highlights. Um, in 1814. Um, uh, Edmonston from Mebury Creek is involved in another expedition, and that's triggered by interactions between Maroons and enslaved people on these plantations. And an expedition is uh, mounted, which which heads north from Mebury Creek, and that again is to this area that was highlighted in in, in the earlier maps. So um, more. Um, Another example. In in total, um, Edmonston led, I think, fifteen bush expeditions during the time that that he was in Demerara. And this is a, an, a, a right at the other uh, uh, at the other end um, uh, of of Guyana um, uh, in Berbice. There there is a. This is the same year as the um, the uprising, which. Uh, Isabel mentioned in, in her introduction, there is also a quite a significant bush expedition um, ran, led by a planter called Gales um, up into the upper reaches of the Kanje River. Um, and from letters written at, at that time, which have survived, um, we get similarly detailed accounts of the life in the camp and similar accounts of the the Maroons having their own blacksmiths, of 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 making their own salt, of growing their own tobacco, of making their own their own pipes. So, you know, yet another um, a, a account of you know gives us quite a lot of detail of of Maroon life. Now we now jump back to Scotland because in eighteen seventeen Charles Edmonston left the colony. Um, he was he he was a good tactician. And um, is from the white planters' point of view, an, an effective organizer of bush expeditions. Once he left, it seems to me that um, they they were much less effectively organized. He he went back to his his home parish in Dumbarton on the west coast of Scotland and, and built this house. It's been was altered slight a bit later on, but it survives. Um, this is his coat of arms on his tomb in the in the the parish church graveyard, and this is an aside, but I, I, I just like to draw your attention to the fact that um, along with him, when he returned to Scotland, 
was a man who had been formerly enslaved, um, given the name John Edmonston, who had been trained at Mebury Creek in taxidermy by one of uh, Edmonston's friends, Charles Waterton. And John Edmonston set himself up as a taxidermist in Edinburgh and gave lessons to, to, to Charles Darwin. So the year after Edmonston left the colony, there was a small uprising um, on plantations New Bee Beehive and Greenfield in Demerara. Um, this was because of the appointment of a new manager. Um, enslaved, a number of enslaved people decamped um, in, into the savannah. There was a negotiation, some of them returned, but some of them remained. And then uh, two recently al al arrived white men on these plantations um, very recklessly led a party of armed enslaved men into the savannah, opened fire, and the, the two of them were killed. Um, it, it, and that was then followed by, by a, a much larger bush expedition, uh, which captured uh, attacked a camp, captured some maroons. Uh, there were there was a particularly brutal ex, uh, execution on one of the plantations of the man they took to be the the leader of the of the uprising, uh, an enslaved man they called Captain Frank. But the the the, ex, the expeditions were it seems to me were um, were, were mishandled. Um. I'm jumping now to eighteen to the to the Demerara uprising of eighteen twenty three, um, and I'm not going to talk about any of the details of that uh, uprising, but I do want to talk about the response to it, because once the 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 main uprising had been suppressed along the coast, on, along the coast, the response was then to organise bush expeditions, very much on the model. Of, of what had been go going on in response to, to maroon settlements. And I think it's interesting that, um, it, first of all, the, the first attempt at an expedition, the, it was so badly organized that the Amerindians just left and they had to, to, to start again. Um, but when they did get the expedition underway, that they talk in the accounts of it of, of four abandoned encampments in, in this area here. Um, and curiously, they 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 talk about uh, one camp which they, they refer to as Jack and Quimina's camp. That's Jack Gladstone and Quimina, two of of the the key leaders of the uprising. Um, and Jack and Quimina weren't 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 captured there, so I'm I'm not quite sure what was meant by saying that that was their camp. But it does at least suggest that. Um, in leading the uprising, they were also aware of routes into the bush and aware and perhaps at some point used this camp. Um, initially, um, when the, when Jack Gladstone and Quimina and others had, had, had gone into the bush, Quimina had asked uh, one, of, one of the others who had escaped, a, a man called Joseph from uh, Bachelor's Adventure, to lead them to um, what I think is a description of the camp um, at the Abbey, which and Joseph claimed to know the, know where that was and know the route to it, and I think it's interesting if they had done that. I think they, they probably would have would have escaped capture, but they chose to remain in, in more familiar ter territory. And, and as you all know, um, Quina was was caught and executed, and, and Jack was caught and and, and, and tried. During um, the evidence that was given in, in the trials, which, which followed the 1823 ups rising, some of the witnesses said that Jack Gladstone had, had said that there were um, a thousand runaways who were willing to come from Wakenham Island to join an uprising. Uh, now, there's no evidence of that, that any Maroons did join the uprising. Um, but it's but it's certainly interesting that um, that they were being talked about, 
by the enslaved during the planning for the uprising. And there were, there were, as I say, there's no, there's no evidence of, of Maroons joining the uprising, and also nothing in the uprising seems to have taken place on the west coast of Demerara. And yet, immediately after the uprising, one of the first things that happens is that a bush expedition is mounted there. Um, it's, it's mounted from, from this plantation Grunveld, um, and they, they attack uh, an encampment of 26 Maroons and 10 huts about here, killing two Maroons, and then travel on, and they're aware of what they call the Great Camp. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce Bonasique. Bon, Bonasique? Bonasique? Um, we have Bonasica now. I don't Bonasica, know Bonasica, yeah. Um, and they talk about this being a great camp. Uh, it's, it's three or four days journey on from here, um, presumably because of difficult terrain, and it's difficult to attack because it's it's surrounded by swamp. Uh, so they're, 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 they, I think you know, the point I want to make is that part of the the mindset in response to the 1823 uprising is the, the awareness of Maroons and the sense that beyond suppressing the uprising, they, um, they need to take action on, 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 the, on the West Coast. I'm jumping back to 1814 now, um, and that Berbice expedition, which I mentioned, the, at least one of the reasons why that expedition was mounted was that an enslaved woman called Antoinette, who was a washerwoman in the household of the missionary John Ray, had been abducted. I'm, 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 this is how she described it. Um, she had been abducted by Maroons on her way from Plantation Sandwort to New Amsterdam. Uh, and there'd been a, there were some, there was a search made for her in the immediate vicinity. She wasn't found, and they believed that she'd been taken to a maroon settlement high up the Kanji, uh, which I've already talked about. Now it turned out she hadn't been. She had in fact been taken to a maroon camp near the Avery Creek. So it's it, the same camp that I've that I've been talking about. Um, and Antoinette remained in that camp for 11 years. Uh, and in 1825, at her own, at her request, she, she it's, it's, it, 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 we've got to be careful with what Antoinette says when she comes back. Um, but um, what she says is she was held there against her will. Um, she was aware of the expedition in 1818 that I mentioned earlier on and tried to, to escape to join that bush expedition, but she was tied and, and carried away by, by the Maroons. But then in 1825, at her request, she was taken back to New Amsterdam by two Maroons who had themselves been living in that camp since 1807. Um, and although these Maroons were imprisoned overnight, they simply got out of jail and returned to the camp. And it's very difficult to know what, what to make of that. But the, um, she, she certainly was returned. Um, she had lived in the camp for 11 years. She'd been brought up speaking a Dutch Creole. Um, when she got back, she struggled to, she, she hadn't been speaking that language for 11 years. And, she, and I think this tells us that it, it was probably an African language that was being spoken in, in, in the camp. I suppose it's possible that it was an English-based Creole, but she she struggled a bit to to talk with her, her father, who was who was who was still alive. Then so Antonia is interesting is in is that her presence in that camp was, um, um both gives us evidence that the, the camp had, had been there for, for a considerable time before and um, spans all of these events, including the Demar uprising of, of 1823. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting um, personal experience, or one, you know, it, 
wish she'd said more about what it had been like in the camp. But one of the things she did say was that at the point when she left, there were many more women in the camp. And that reinforces what I was saying earlier on about the, the, that change between the very early days in 1804 and, the, and, eight, eight, and 18, 18, 9, 18, 10. Um, I just want to finish with a, with a um, couple of couple of other things. This is the the last the, the last account I can find of uh, of Maroons in in Guyana before uh, uh, the end of colonial slavery. And it's a book published in eighteen thirty three um, by a, a, a Captain J E Alexander. Um, he was from the the forty second regiment, who were who were known as the Black Watch. And that's because they were a, a very dark tartan, um, and he he'd been in um, in the Caribbean, but he'd also written already by this point written books about travels in Persia and other parts of Africa. Um, he's, but he's in the book he's writing about his experiences there in eighteen thirty one, and this is on the the far west coast of, of Demerara, where he's on, he's on an estate where, uh, and I, I, I'm not quite sure how to seriously to take what he says, because he gives an impression that um, the whole, the, the enslaved people running away, living for a time as, as in the bush and then coming back has, has almost become a game um, because he, he says that when a new manager is appointed, the enslaved on the plantation sort of test him out. Uh, some are insolent, some are refused to work. And if they're threatened with punishment, they run away and, and secrete themselves in the forest. And then an expedition will be mounted to, to, to bring them, them back. And as he says, they'll be lightly punished under the eye of the fiscal. Uh, I just don't believe that. Um, but he clearly, but he, he, he certainly by this point is a pretty low opinion of the the whites who are taking part in these ex, in these expeditions. Um, I, I think he talks about on the second morning of the expedition, um, one man complained of illness for want of his coffee. I I know that feeling. Um, another said he'd been able to proceed having lost a shoe in the mud. And a third said he must look after his helpmate, um, who's probably an enslaved woman or a free woman of colour who was in the family way. Um, and in fact, it's um, somebody called Fraser and some Arawak who uh, track down the runaways and, and bring them back. Um, and I wanted to include that, not because I think it adds very much to uh, our understanding of what's um, of what the the maroon camps were like, but because I think it does show that right to, towards the the end of colonial slavery, the camps are surviving, um, which is the reason why um, I've called this this article um, I've written, which I'm basing this talk, um, the Guyana Maroon 1796 to 1834 persistent and resilient until the end of slavery. I think I've actually put the, the adjectives in the other order for, for, the, for this talk. Um, this is published in, in Slavery and Abolition um, earlier this year. Uh, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. And, but but my, my email is there. I'm you know, very happy for people to get in touch if, if, if you want more details or uh, copies of transcripts of, of any of these documents that I've mentioned. Thank you, David. Uh, fascinating. Um, and uh, really gives us a sense of um, both the longevity of, of some of those communities um, and the scale. I mean, you talked about 200 acres, and I just wondered if... That, the, well, what's the rough size I, I, of, a, of a plantation then? I mean, it... it um, wouldn't mean anything. Like yes, that. I mean plantations are often uh, 
250 acres probably so it's okay. it's a plantation and so actually one, one thing that i that i forgot to to, to quote um was that Edmonston said that the the rice they had found being stored was enough to feed seven hundred enslaved people for a year, um, which also explains why they're why they've got surplus, which explains why they're trading with the coast. Um, I think there'll be a trade in in you know stolen metal implements, for example, um, which their blacksmiths can then rework into into tools. Well, that, that's a really interesting question. I think um, the enslaved man called Inverness, who I mentioned, I'm fairly sure that he is Akan. I mean, he, he would have been he he was ref, he was referred to as a Coromante. Um, but it's clear that um, there's one of the things which triggers the 1809 expedition was an incident where some of the Maroons had. Um, come down towards the Berbice River, they were armed um, and they had they had abducted, now, I mean, was going to be, they'd abducted a number of women. Now, it's possible the women went willingly, but the crucial point is that they communicate by gestures. So that suggests that the women, whether they went freely or not, didn't share a common language with, with the Maroons, who I think are Coromanti. So I, I think what you're ending up with is uh, a, a mixture of people in the camp, but probably with a, a dominant number of Akan from Ghana and, and, surround, and, and surrounding areas. I hope, I hope Ian can come in, but while we're waiting, I, I noticed that there's a question about asking where Antoinette's story is recorded. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's it the information is in in the diaries of John Ray, now um, the missionary. Now there's the published version of these, which were, was printed um, later in the nineteenth century. But there are also the originals, which are held by the London Missionary Society, and and a lot of the most interesting detail is in the the original rather than the, in the printed version. Um, so that I I can't I can't remember if this if the if. Um, just ex how much of the detail is in the printed diary, but there's there's more in the in, in the in the original, in, and and that's where the inf uh, that's where the information that she spoke she spoke a D Dutch or Dutch Creole um, comes from. The Amerin because of the vulnerability of the colonies, the um, the Amerindians are in a very powerful negotiating position, and they know it. So their relationship with the the white planters is that if 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 the if the annual gifts are made and the payments are made, they will take part in the bush expeditions. Um, I I can't I I don't I haven't come across any evidence of us you know of any kind of supportive interaction between Amerindians and the and the Maroons. But that's not to say it didn't happen. Thank you for that. Um, we'll take uh, John Rickford's question next and then loop back to the chat. Yes, I enjoyed this very much. Since we happen to have um, with us Ian Robertson, who is one of the world experts on Burby's Dutch, I wonder if he can tell us if he's still there, um, whether doing his work in the Burbies area for many years, um, he found anything relating to the Maroon presence. I, I, for instance, you mentioned um, Antoinette uh, being a, a speaker of Bur Burbies Dutch. So I wonder if um, Ian, if he's here, can make a few comments. I think it's... Uh, this is Ian Robertson. Ah, welcome. <laughs> yes, had difficulties. But um, yes, thanks, John. My my work on the Burbies leads me to two questions. I I don't know that I've encountered people who knew specifically about these Maroon settlements. 
But certainly in the historical history documents, such as, the, you know, that, well, in the documents, I'd come across them. Two things I, I think might be relevant, however. Much of my work was done in the Viruni area because that's where all the speakers who I discovered, there were the few remaining speakers, about 30 of them, um, there they were from the Biruni area. And it's interesting that the one plantation that remained after the 1763 rebellion was calling the Jacoba, which is on the, um, on the Biruni Creek. Um, that in itself is interesting. Um, and I suspect that that is just the reason the language is retained. The other thing is that the dominant African input, and it's clear, is uh, uh, one of the, the Eastern Edo um, language dialects. And in that area, decidedly, um, the, the linguistic evidence says there must have been some kind of ego dominance, whether or not it was in the social structure or whether it was um, uh, numerical. So I, I thought like I could share that, share that in response to John's. Mm. Um, I, I suppose one of the things that I that I that I, I'm not clear about is uh, in in this period of the the establishment of the plantations along the coast, where I think many of those who are escaping are Coromanti, are are they joining already established camps, and so are are you know, are are they are they fitting into it to an to an existing maroon culture, which may well be would I think would have been based on a dominance of of other ethnic groups there's there there are some re, there are some references to Igbo camps in what well, to an Igbo camp in in Demerara there's also an interesting notion that because at Barakara although I never found any Barbisca speakers at Barakara um the that is the location in which um, maroon settlement, a maroon settlement was supposed to have been. Yes, and and that's um, in that uh, that eighteen fourteen ex, um, expedition. Yes, that's that, and that's that's the area where where, where it's confirmed. It's in it. There's there's also um, the that that was led by a plantation owner called Gales. Um, who had an extensive uh, woodcutting plantation on the Kanji. Um, he let away, he let away bankrupt. And because of that, um, the, there was a threat that the enslaved people would be moved from the Kanji um, down to closer to New Amsterdam. And many of them at that point went into the, went into the bush as, as maroons. Um, I, I, I would just like to make one last comment, and that is that the practice of the Watamama celebration in Babis, uh, there was one major um, slave who was um, executed in 18 something, 1823, I think for breaching this, the, the, the regulations. What is important is that among the states, it was called Mingi Mama. And Mingi is the Eastern Ijo word for water. Mm. So I thought I threw that in just to I help think, to mm, locate yes. the, the, the yes. people. Mm. I could also add the, the, the names for the core elements, um, which are in Burmese Dutch, are all um, out of Eastern Ijo, and especially things like body parts, drink, eat, sleep, walk, and so on. I think that's critical. <laughs>
I don't know the answer, but, but I've, I've got some thoughts. Um, I think a difference in Suriname is that the the Maroon communities have been established at a greater distance from the coast earlier on. Uh, and they've been strong enough that from an earlier point, there have been negotiations between the um, the, the between the Dutch um, and the Maroons. So in in the case, so Stedman's so Stedman is describing the wars with the Boney Maroons. The, the Samaka had come to a negotiated peace with the with the Dutch and had agreed to close their community to, to new escapees in I think it's about 1707. Mm -hmm. So from a very early from from from, from an early point um, they, they've at least entered into an agreement where they're, they're not accepting more escapees. Um, they had a treaty in early uh, 1750s, I think, 1760. Yeah, 1760, right. So, I, so I think, I think there's, I think, the, I think there's a difference there. Um, it's, but certainly, at, at the point at which British planters are becoming involved in bear beasts. They think they certainly think there's a threat. Um, they think there's a threat if the French in Cayenne encourage the Suriname Maroons to extend their influence into Berbice. Um, so, so that's a, that's a white British perspective of it. Um, so, so whether. Um, so whether there are links being made, I I just don't know. I, the other thing that I, I I think would need I I I don't really have any understanding of is the is is changes in the the territories over which different Amerindian groups seek to have influence, and you know since there are different groups, whether their their approach will be will be different. So it it certainly. It certainly seems that the Arawak, in the period I'm talking about, a lot of it is through their relationship with Charles Edmonston. They they seem to be very much on board with with the the colony authorities, um, but it's a relationship they're quite willing to walk away from um, if 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 they if if they no longer see it if if the gifts. And the payments are no longer being delivered. They just, they just, they just disappear. So it's not a, um, it's not a loyalty. Um, and are does that mean that at other points they're acting in other ways? And does it mean that the other Amerindian groups have a different approach? I, I just, I just don't know. But it's such an interesting topic, and I think it's a measure of the, um, the, the paucity of research in this area that uh, we have so many questions. Uh, so thank you very much indeed.